Old Prussia was once home to, well, Prussians. Not those ones, but rather these ones, the Baltic Prussians. In history, they were eventually removed from their homelands by Teutonic Crusaders, and eventually Prussia itself was completely Germanized. Today, Prussia is associated with the military prowess of the Prussian Germans and their triumphant army with the state. The Old Prussian language is actually extremely important for my academic field outside of YouTube, which is linguistics, because Old Prussian is the only Western Baltic language for which we have an actual corpus of literature. Back to the game, though. Prussians in CK3 are a relatively uninteresting culture. They get access to the very overpowered forest warden archer men-at-arms, and that's about all that's special about them. The Vitalist Faith is pretty meh, but it at least has one unique tenant, which gives bonuses to pregnant characters. That being said, I've been given an objective by the community to accomplish. I'm supposed to reform Vitalism, putting myself as the head of Faith with female preference, then take the proclaimed Terra Mariana decision and roleplay as a theocracy. On the voting titles should be granted to others of my Faith ASAP. I lose the run if I lose my Head of Faith or Livonia. I win the run when I am the majority religion or when I get bored. Bonus points for landing independent rulers rather than creating vassals or fellow vassals. This run was requested by Terra Kitsune, who you might remember from the AI Roman Empire run. This guy is pretty good at coming up with run ideas. That being said, I did modify this run to make it a bit simpler. First of all, I got rid of the roleplay stuff and the bonus point stuff, and then added my own change to make the video nice and clickable. I am instead going to conquer Germany as the old Prussians and then do one secret objective at the end involving some other famous military peoples. Stay tuned for it. Anyway, let's get into the game. First off, we create our custom character, who will in time unite the Baltic people against the foreigners that would threaten them. I'm playing at 1066 as a little extra challenge and because I prefer to have the game move a little faster technology wise. So the custom character, she's pretty simple. I'm basically just making a somewhat meta character. She's Vitalist and Prussian, with only the temperate trait to help her live longer. I unfortunately did not think to hide my camera to show off her stats, but I put everything into martial, stewardship, and learning. With this character, I intend to reform Vitalism and establish my domain. In terms of opening moves, I'm just going to raid the people around me and try to max up my domain when I can. Unfortunately, the other bolts of the region are about as strong as me, and I can't consistently raid them without risking losing, so I'm a bit stuck. I'm going to have to get a bit creative. One of the larger vassals of my duchy had no heir, so I'll kill him and inherit his three counties. It was a genius plan, but it was a bit slow, as unfortunately, Denmark decided to holy war for one of my counties. Because they only want a single county, I'm not too worried. Worst case scenario, I lose one county and take it back when I'm stronger, but nonetheless, I was going to fight. In theory, Denmark should absolutely crush me here, but I do have those insane forest warden units who get bonuses in forests and just have super high stats. Luckily for me, my neighbor Samagisha came in to help and with their support, I was able to catch Denmark just after disembarking which made the battle much easier. Denmark had Huskarls which counter archers making them extremely scary, but nonetheless the pure power of my archers in their home terrain led us to win in the first battle. It was also right after this first fight that I assassinated the triple chief to whom I was an heir. I got his three counties and I am significantly stronger. I used my extra prestige to just buy even more forest wardens and hope to outnumber Denmark in the forests. I disbanded my army and waited until my reinforcements came in so I could confront the Danes in yet another battle of the forests. They learned from last time and stayed in the plains, but given our immense numerical advantage now, we could just take them down outside of the forest anyway. With that, another victory went to the Prussians. They retreated across the Vistula into Poland once again, but this time I chased them down. At this point, the Danes called on their allies, the Swedes, to come save them. But even with their support, I was able to win pretty much every battle. After two years of fighting and a complete victory, the Danes surrendered. It was a nice boost to my fame to win all those battles, and getting the gold from winning the war was great too. Thanks, Denmark. I honestly owe the success quite heavily to the Samogitians who helped out, although my acquisition of those three counties via inheritance also sealed the deal. In order to pay back the debt I owe my Baltic neighbors, I decided to raid and pillage their homes to weaken them before promptly conquering them without a care for the debt I owed them. A little savage, you might say, but they don't see the big picture. I'm saving the Balts by fighting to keep the Balts unified, you see. The wars I did here to take Lithuania, Livonia, and Latvia are pretty simple. By this point, I'm far more powerful than anyone else in the area, so these wars were simple. The High Chieftain of the Samogitians, Kukovaitis, who once helped me fight off the Danes, was eventually captured in battle during the Northward campaigns, and although I felt sad to execute him just so I could end a truce a couple years early, I did it with a salute, as without him, this run would have died and probably been restarted, wasting a few minutes of my time. will never be forgotten, Kukovaitis. Anyway, it's time to dethrone his son. That was easy. The wars continued until all but Estonia was conquered. I had to await a truce, so I looked around the map a bit and hey, check it out, Norwegian England. What I could do in the meantime was focus on getting the piety I'd need to reform the faith. 
My queen, Grassus, was 42 and still healthy, so I didn't need to rush. But I'd need to get to the profit perk to possibly afford the piety cost of reformation. I swapped over to the theology focus to generate some piety now while I work towards the perks I'd need. I had a momentary scare when I caught Typhus, but after some time, I did recover and the run was not over. After surviving Typhus, the Estonian's truce was up, and I went to grab the last piece of land I'd need for the Terra Mariana decision. The war was easy, and thus Livonia was founded, and the Balts united. The mother of the Baltic, Grassus, now only had one lifetime goal left. Reform the faith. Now that I've conquered the entire region, my goal is twofold. I need to reform the faith, but I also need to spend all this prestige I've collected. I'm spending it, of course, on tribal buildings, like war camps and gathering halls. In terms of meta, in case you're watching this as some kind of guide, war camps are pretty much the only thing worth building. I ended up building every building because I had leftover prestige. The palisades are okay because of the fort level, and the markets are okay because money can be nice, albeit not useful for tribes. The gathering hall prestige benefit is convenient, but considering the prestige investment, it's only worth it if you hold those gathering halls for a long time. The best upgrade is to go from level 1 tribal holding to level 2, but it's also the most expensive. Anyway, this part of the run is mostly domain building and perk gathering, so I don't have a huge amount to say. That being said, I made a personal discovery this run that I wasn't aware of till this run. Oh, I do? What? I didn't know that- Prussians get long ships, that's insane. Wait a minute. Open the decision, oh, it comes from the Terra, Mar Terra Marinera, I see, okay. Turns out, even a Giga Chad like me still has things to learn in CK3. When you hit the Terra Mariana decision, your culture unlocks longboats. I genuinely did not know that, and was surprised to see it since it makes the decision way better than I ever thought it was. Something I could go raiding just about anywhere, and that was very exciting. It was time to go to Constantinople. Well, it would have been, but I got cold feet. I'm pretty sure the Greek cataphracts would wipe the floor with my archers in open ground, so I instead went to Paris. So pretty prestigious. Before going though, I took the Defenders of Dievas decision, since you can't take the decision once you reform the faith. It lets you build the Hall of Heroes building in Middleist Holy Sites, so it's important to take it before reforming. Anyway, fighting France went pretty well. They had heavy cavalry which do counter my archers, but based on pure numbers and being a better general, I was able to win the fight in Paris. My current military composition is basically all forest wardens plus a single group of light cavalry. The point of that is to add some pursuit to the army. The archers win the fight but can't inflict many casualties. That's when the cavalry come in and pick off routed soldiers. This strategy will continue to be what I do, except later on I'll be getting some even better pursuit units. If you can guess what unit that'll be, comment it below and I'll pin the first person to get it right. When I did the Defender of the Avis decision, my nickname changed from Mother of the Baltic to Defender of the Avis, which is kind of a downgrade in my opinion, but whatever. I raided Rome and parts of Italy, then went back home and finally decided to reform the faith. I changed to female dominated, polygamous, female accepted adultery, and accepted kin slang. I also made women only allowed to be clergy. I of course went with lay clergy so I could get a temporal head of faith, making me the head of faith. I went with communion, kudiki slempti, and monasticism, as something of an homage to the original roleplay challenge of being a theocracy. I also went fundamentalist, again as an homage. One thing I completely forgot was that by being female dominated, my daughters were my heirs now, which meant suddenly I had new heirs to deal with. I hadn't put any thought into grooming my kids to be rulers, so this sort of sucked, but luckily, at least one of my daughters was pretty okay. Although Mila was already 35 and unmarried, she was good enough. She had okay stats across the board, and with a high stat husband, she should be able to make up at least her stewardship for the domain. Anyway, with the faith reformed, the succession secured, and still quite some life left in the queen, it was time to look outwards. The obvious target for the Prussians was Poland. Even though they had allowed the Danes all that time ago to retreat through their land, the grudge never quite died. Alongside that, Poland is big, rich, and relatively weak after the death of their longtime king. The new 12-year-old king is weak and his realm will fall easily to the Prussians. I declared a holy war for the whole kingdom all at once, and then immediately died. Yeah, that sort of took me by surprise. I genuinely thought Grassus would live a little bit longer. Oh well, I guess it's Mila's time to conquer Poland. Without Grassus to lead, the strategic ability of the army was lowered a bit. But through the immense strength of the forest wards and just sheer numbers, the Poles nonetheless were defeated in battle after battle. With a couple occupations around the Vistula, the shameful Poles surrendered and lost everything to the Prussians. With Poland under control, a massive swath of land is now under the Livonian crown, and with it will inevitably come populist uprisings to uproot the pagan overlords. They're not ready to rise up yet, but rest assured they will be in the near future. With the Poles conquered, the backwards forest dwellers of the Baltic were able to study the feudal ways of their new subjects, and I adopted feudalism. This was pretty opportune because at this point, I'm going to need the ability to get my domain to higher levels than just tribalism if I want to fight stronger opponents in the Holy Roman Empire. Oh, by the way, I found the Chintamani Stone at one point during an adventure, and it immediately made me think of that guy from Uncharted 2 that always talks about the Chintamani Stone. And remember that game? Prince to Shambhala. What they really wanted was the Chintamani Stone. 
Returning to the game, I was invading Danzig when the Catholic Poles finally decided to rebel, so that was a little inconvenient. Nonetheless, popular uprisings are nothing to worry about since they don't use any men-at-arms. Remember that levies suck, and popular uprisings are composed of only levies and sometimes light infantry and archers. My archers are just better than theirs, so we have nothing to worry about. I went and defeated a nearby rebel army, then resumed the war against Pomerania, which I intended to finish off before dealing with the Poles. I defeated the Polish rebellions as the armies were nearby, but for whatever reason, immediately after winning, another one popped up again, so I had to do it again. At this point, I was kind of running out of money, so I was a bit irked. To save the economy, I just went and ransomed every prisoner I had, and suddenly my budget was quite healthy again. Either way, I did win the war against Pomerania, and I did put down the Polish rebels. Things worked out, thank goodness. I used Mila's life as an opportunity to just make money and focus on the domain. We did lots of expansion, and needed time to convert the new subjects. Once they were converted, and the domain was built up more, I had resumed the expansion of Prussia. That relatively peaceful time would be the entirety of Mila's life, as she died at 60, leaving the throne to her daughter Ziedis. She was quite the successor, with high diplomacy, martial, and stewardship stats, alongside a respectable learning skill. She only lacked intrigue. But hey, if everyone likes you, who needs intrigue? Oftentimes, high diplomacy can counteract low intrigue, since high diplomacy makes everyone like you. I was looking around the map at this point, and saw that the Norwegians of England had hybridized and formed the English culture. It's always nice to see some unique cultures form, so that was pretty cool. They chose strange traditions, but to each their own. Anyway, it was finally time to resume the conquests. I fought the remaining section of Pomerania and had an easy time. The big ticket item for Ziedas was going to be Germany, but for now Pomerania would be okay. Along the way, despite the staunch traditionalism of the Poles, I was able to hybridize with them and form Pruthenian culture. I wasn't being particularly creative with that name, but it worked. I took Forest Wardens, Sacred Groves, Xenophilic, Equitable, and Coney Raids, leaving one slot open for reform right away. Getting the Coney Raids was the main appeal of this hybrid since I was going to use Coney as my new pursuit unit. If you guessed Coney before, nicely done, since Coney are some of the highest pursuit units in the game, and they're kind of insanely good for that specific purpose. Although they're not too good overall, they, in combination with my archer units, will get a huge number of kills in each battle, which we'll look at once we get into some bigger battles with worthy opponents. During the peacetime after Pomerania, the Kaiser of the Horman Empire decided to romance Zietus. This was an interesting choice to say the least, but for the memes, I let it happen. When I was given the opportunity to allow the romance or not, I thought why not? After all, for my religion, women can commit adultery as I even shunned, let alone a crime, so what do I have to lose? Heinrich and I became soulmates, despite his faith forbidding him. He also was married, which was of course intolerable. The Kaiser was all mine, and that meant it was time to go to war to punish him for seeing other women. For his crime, he'd have to give up all of Germany. I'm sure Heinrich was into dominant women, otherwise he wouldn't have romanced a woman as powerful as Zietas, so I'm sure he was happy to get into a pretty much life or death war for the fate of Christendom against Baltic pagans. It was time for a real worthy opponent. I had defeated the Poles and Pomeranians, but the true opponent was the Holy Roman Empire. In 1154, I decided to go after Germany, and this war wouldn't be as easy as previous ones. Being a holy war, other Catholics got involved in the war, and that was pretty bad for me. This was going to be a very long war, given I'd have to fend off the Germans, the Hungarians, and Lotharingians, who all joined the war. Although initially, I was winning some small skirmishes and got a couple occupations, once the opposing armies grouped up, I was getting wrecked, and thus, a war that would go on for more than a decade began. This is the Great Prusso-German War. With the recent losses and horrific failures of my invasion off the bat, my new strategy was one of attrition. I was going to lower my troops and let the coalition forces die to siege attrition and eventually run their coffers dry in the hopes that they'd not be able to reinforce their armies. Alongside that, I did some tactical espionage action, taking boats through the Rhine to find my way into Würzburg, the Roman capital. I landed there behind enemy lines, taking many casualties to get through enemy land, but I was able to take Würzburg. I was hoping to capture the Kaiser and the siege and win the war easily, but I was not so lucky. After taking Würzburg, I lost it nearly as quickly as I got it, and soon the war looked lost. I was at negative 96% war score, but I did the same tactic again as I headed to Würzburg through the Rhine. During the siege, I hit negative 99% war score, but I did manage to save the day and take Würzburg again. By the way, if I were playing as a Kaiser right now, I'd be so angry about all this. It was ridiculous that my tactic here worked. I managed to capture the Kaiser's wife in the second Würzburg siege, who I promptly executed for daring to be with my soulmate Heinrich. The stress of still not being able to see her lover, largely due to war, broke something in Zaitis, as after the execution of the Kaiserin, she promptly went insane. Anyway, after the execution of his wife, the Kaiser and his coalition marched south to Würzburg, defeated my army again, and I was back at square one. I considered surrendering, but no, I would not give in so easily. Instead, I would be forced to surrender. You might be saying, wait, wasn't this conflict a decade long? Did you lie? Well, yes and no. See, this conflict is more than just one war. That war was only four years long, but this conflict wasn't over yet. Upon losing the war, a civil war in Livonia began, with the vassals seeking a reduction in crown authority. Although I had first tried to fight, I saw that it was a hopeless fight, so I surrendered, and thus owed all my vassals a hook. The realm looked to be in rough shape. The next move I made against the Kaiser was to make an artifact in his name, thus exposing him as an adulterer. 
Being a free woman, Zietas didn't care, but Heinrich's reputation took a hit from being an adulterer. Despite their romantic relations, it seemed that Heinrich was starting to really dislike Zietas for her work against him. Heinrich did eventually die from his infirm health, leaving the Empire in the hands of Liutberg. Zietas would miss Heinrich and get a lot of stress from his death, but she also was glad he was gone, given the embarrassment of losing a war to him. Zietas, now known as Strongarm, despite her military losses, let the conflict cool off a bit. She focused on building up her castles for her heirs, who would within a few more years take the throne over. In 1184, Zietas died and left the throne to Mila II, who was ready to continue the war against the Germans in her mother's name. For now, it would be a test war. Mila declared war for Nordmark only, and wasn't as ambitious as her mother. Nonetheless, she'd eventually come for Germany. This time, she would not fail. Using her new trebuchets and larger, better trained army that her mother provided, Mila won decisively against the Kaiser's army. That being said, she did lose a battle in the forests along the border in Polabia, mostly due to the Lotharingian army and its supporting troops. This war wouldn't be a cakewalk unless Mila could isolate smaller armies and pick them off. After losing significant ground in Pomerania, the war looked grim, but the Kaiser and Lotharingia were running out of money, leaving them vulnerable. The Coney had been inflicting huge deaths, which we can see in the Battle of Havelberg, where 10,000 men were cut down to just 2,000 in one fight. This is what Coney are good at. All they won't win you battles, they make you absolutely crush battles that you have already won. When the tides of battle turned, Mila won her family's first victory in war against the Kaiser, even if it took a long time. A brief period of peace ensued, followed by another war, this time for the true goal, Germany. Unfortunately, as seems to be traditional at this point, the Prussian monarch died just moments into the war. This was actually quite unfortunate since the realm succession hadn't been organized yet, and for the first time Livonia was partitioned. Livonia was in the east, and Lithuania in the west, although Lithuania was mostly composed of Pomerania really. Fighting against the Holy Roman Empire in this time of turmoil was painful, but the first major battle in Baitom went in the Balts' favor. After making some progress into Germany, the new queen, Zietas II, disbanded the army and was ready for a long war of attrition. This time she wouldn't fail like her ancestors. The only problem was that by sharing her land with her sister, she wasn't making nearly as much money as before. This attrition tactic would harm her almost as much as her enemies. Regardless, by taking fights in forest terrain where possible, Zietas II was able to win another major battle and things looked good. The next major campaign was a blitz straight to Würzburg, as Zietas II personally led her army through lightning fast sieges to the capital. She took far too many losses along the way though and had to disband once again. The Germans were on a counter offensive and took back much of the progress she had made, but they were running on almost no gold whatsoever. While things were looking bad, they only got worse when yet another battle was lost, and more importantly, the Queen of Lithuania, Zietas II's sister, was captured by the enemy. This gave them even more war score. This war is truly like a beach tide. It just pushes and pulls in one direction than the other over and over. It was impressive watching the war score continuously change, but finally, significant progress was made when Zietas blitzed through Germany to Würzburg and captured the Kaiser's heir. After the siege, news of a new invader from the east came to Zietas, who ignored it in the face of more important issues facing her own right now. Those Mongols might be a problem later though. The war looked like it might never end, but fortunately, one battle in the outskirts of Würzburg would determine the fate of the whole war. The Kaiser had been captured, and with that, the war was over. The Kaiser had been captured, and with that, the war over, finally. Germany was finally conquered, and the Germans were defeated. The problem now was holding on to it, as the Ruthenians had declared a war to take some land in Poland, but while dealing with that war, the German Catholics rose up in rebellion. Zietas wasn't able to get over to Germany fast enough to stop them from occupying enough land to actually win the war. This created the new kingdom of Midden, a peasant kingdom now ruling itself between the Balts and the Holman Empire. This complicates things. With conflict calming down, I'd have to come back for Germany later. For now, the partition of my kingdom is the most important thing to take care of. Although losing Pomerania doesn't bother me much, what sucks about Lithuania existing is that it holds much of my domain. I'm stuck at 5 out of 10 domain, and that's not good for my income. Without money, I can't raise armies big enough to deal with my enemies. That means I'm going to go to war with Lithuania for the land they hold in my actual kingdom. I'm going to let my sister keep Pomerania, at least for now, and come back for it later. I was checking on the Kingdom of Midden, and for whatever reason, Walter White over here is just holding on to his domain, sitting at 32 out of 8. My hope was for him to create Germany, which I have a claim to, so I could do a simple claim war, but for whatever reason, he refused to make the title. Before I lost the populist war, I created Germany, and after losing the war, the title was destroyed. I still have my claim, but until someone makes it, I can't press a claim. Either way, the war with my sister was easy and I got most of my domain back. It was good, men. I went for my other sister in Estonia next, and then checked up on the Mongols, who had been expanding slowly but surely out east. With some time, the truce with the Midden was up, and now it was Zietas' turn to declare a war for Germany, and who knows, maybe she'll die too. This war was pretty tough, if only because I just don't have the same kind of income I once did due to the increasing costs of my men at arms. In order to defeat my enemies, I need more men, but they're expensive. I try to win battles, and when I win, I go assault a few castles and then disband to save money. 
If I lose, I run away, disband, and wait to reinforce. It's all I can do. My only real tactic is to just outlast my opponent's coffers. Either way, this war goes similarly to the previous wars for Germany, but it also goes a little faster. This war was only 6 years of back and forth attrition warfare, and I came out on top. This time I will not lose the kingdom to populists. After the war, I went to grab Pomerania so I could have some nice, aesthetic borders, and that war was mindlessly basic. Check out Livonia now, damn, that's a nice look. It's popular uprising time, and it went way better this time around. I simply captured the peasant leader within 2 battles time, and with that the German Catholics are put down. They then rose up again a couple months later, which confused me, but it is what it is. This one took a bit longer, but I also won against the rebellion, and now we're good. Anyway, with Germany secure, and the realm no longer fractured between sisters, a new realm had to be born. Prussia. This is the glorious empire of Prussia, to whom Germany is subservient. Baltic Prussia is a beautiful blue color, and I even did a simple coat of arms to be just like Prussia's. Some people wanted yellow Prussia, but those people are stupid, so I kept Prussia blue. My income is great, my army size is huge, and my empire is secure. I am at that point most Secret 3 players reach where eventually the game is impossible to lose. No realm is ever completely safe from chain assassination or a complete collapse of the domain, but that's only through gross mismanagement. Funnily enough, despite the female dominated nature of my religion and empire, when Zia's second died she had no daughters, and therefore the second Prussian emperor in this matriarch would be her son, Budo. At this point in the run, I was just kind of chilling and memeing. I saw that Temujin had a bunch of daughters, and I thought, what if? I was in fact able to get a marriage to one of his daughters, and that means within just a couple generations I'd be able to claim the Mongol Empire. To prove myself to the Khan, I sent him the skull of a great wolf, which meant a lot to him. In fact, it meant more than even love, since it gave him 87 opinion of me, while the lover modifier is only 80 opinion. With this gift of a great wolf skull, which had been collecting dust in my artifact bin, I was able to secure the marriage. Although for now I was friends with the Khan, I'd be promptly betraying him in good time. Maybe that wolf skull was a threat, as opposed to a token of friendship. For now, the next couple of decades were going to be all about the domain and waiting until I have kids with this Mongol princess. Over the course of this immense time of unadulterated peace, I was able to form a hybrid culture with the Franconians to form Prussian culture. Well, okay. Prussian culture already exists, but I formed Prussian culture but in German, Preussen. Conveniently, after forming the new culture, Genghis Khan died. I would have pushed my Kaiserin's claim right away, but I had too little prestige. I thought about it and just decided to take a hit to my fame to declare the war now. Why not? I was going to push my Kaiserin's claim, kill her, and watch my child inherit the empire, and then take the empire from him, and no one could stop me. Declaring a land war in Asia is always an awful idea, and indeed I watched thousands of my men die to the harsh steps, but this is CK3. I can just generate more men from thin air as need be, and relatively quickly, so those deaths are meaningless to me. I just kept occupying stuff, and the Mongol army was actually nowhere to be found. I was a little confused, but okay with it. At one point, I did find them, and the battle was easy due to it only being a small force of a couple thousand. After that, I won the war through further occupations, now my wife rules the Mongol Empire. I know I said there'd be a great battle between two empires, but it wasn't actually that great of a battle since the Mongols kinda just let me rampage through the holdings. Oh well, get baited. Pretty cool to have the two greatest empires on the map being husband and wife, but my plan's next step required me to kill her, and so I did. She was perfectly unpopular amongst her vassals due to being the wrong religion and a woman, so it took no time at all. Her death resulted in my daughter, Gurkis, becoming the new Kaiserin of the Mongol Empire. That is extremely cursed. Either way, I had an easy way to unite the realms. She's my heir, so I'm just going to start a tyranny war and then lose intentionally. This will cause a succession, which will pass Prussia onto my Mongol daughter. Easy. Now Prussia rules the steppes, and its homeland. I didn't want to play as this little girl though, so I did the same thing again, and I lost another tyranny war to force succession over to my father again. Important to note here, I'm not just the Mongol Kaiser in name. I do in fact have the Mongol invasion costs belly, and I have the Mongol hosts available to me. With that, I could have gone on to conquer the world, but that would have been boring, so I ended the run here. I was pretty hyped with this one, and more or less forgot about the objective of the run partway through as I was just having fun. Anyway, that's the run. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Terry Kitsune for coming up with this run. If you want to suggest a run for me to do, come to my Twitch chat and use your channel points to officially add the run to the list which I can look at to decide what to do. Here's the current list from other chatters. Do any of them interest you? Let me know on my Discord or on stream. These days, I'm playing most CK3 over there and Resident Evil 4, desperately trying to get a good speedrun time. Hope to see you there. Thank you for your time.